this story is true. It is based upon official records, eyewitness accounts, and sworn testimony. All names are real. Every action is based on fact. My name is Lloyd Mark Booker. Lloyd Mark Booker. Uh, from the time I was a very small youngster, I had a yearning for the sea. I chose the Navy because I love it. Certainly. In 1938, the movie Boys Town, starring Spencer Tracy and Mickey Rooney, appeared at a theater in Lewiston, Idaho. I convinced the sisters at the orphanage to arrange me to see it, and later I asked them to transfer me there. They wrote to Father Flanagan, and a new phase of my life began. I arrived in Boys Town in the summer of 1941. There were 200 children there, and soon they were all like my brothers. They were my family. A reading, I read uh, all of Robert Louis Stevenson and the other adventure stories popular at the time. I became acquainted with people like uh, Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. Rudyard Kipling was one of my favorites, and the poet, Willa Cather. I still read a lot, and I like classical music. Football was number one for me. I played halfback and occasionally end, but I was particularly happy in the line. As a blocker, I enjoyed the contact, the tackles. I'll never forget the time our coach, Skip Palrang, lined us up in the field and said, Okay, here's where we separate the men from the boys. Skipper contributed more than any other single individual to my outlook on life. My compassion for other human beings, my desire to win, my desire to make America come out on top. In accordance with Section 935, Title 10 of the United States Code of Uniform Military Justice, I've been instructed to convene a court of inquiry. The court will investigate the circumstances relating to the seizure of the USS Pueblo, AGER-2, by North Korean Navy vessels, which occurred in the Sea of Japan, January 23, 1968. I got the name Pete because I was particularly impressed with a college player called Pete P Pius, uh, who was a special favorite of mine. I only used my real name, uh, Lloyd Mark, on very formal occasions. Later, I uh, enlisted in the Navy for a couple of years before I entered the University of Nebraska on a football scholarship. I loved the Navy, and I agreed to a reserve officer candidate program to accept a commission, should I be worthy of it. The court will also inquire into the circumstances surrounding the actual boarding. It will inquire into all the facts and circumstances surrounding the subsequent detention of the vessel, its officers, and crew. My wife? My wife comes from Jefferson City, Missouri. We met at the university on a blind date at the homecoming game between Missouri and Nebraska. I continued dating Rose that year, my junior year, after I hurt my knee. And after eight or nine months, I asked if she would marry me. Pete had a dental appointment, and I went with him. And while we were sitting in the waiting room, he just slipped an engagement ring into my hand. I was commissioned an officer and a gentleman in the Navy by act of Congress. I certainly didn't feel up to being a gentleman on my own. I've been an officer for 15 years now. The court is authorized to submit its findings of fact, opinion, and recommendations to the convening authority and is instructed to recommend administrative or disciplinary action as appropriate. I owe it all to Boys Town. I come back there every year, every summer. And every boy there who's ever been there is a part of my family, as close to me as one of my own two sons. Boys Town stands for the symbol that Father Flanagan meant it to be, a true home, 
with all the love that could possibly be generated. Court is convened in open session at the U.S. Naval Amphibious Base, Coronado, California, at 0900, 20 January, 1969. Commander Booker? Yes, sir. Commander Booker, we know that your year of imprisonment has been most difficult. Do you feel that your physical and emotional condition is sufficiently improved to permit you to undergo the requirements of the court? Yes, sir, I'm feeling much better. Medical reports confirm his readiness, sir. We are glad to hear it. Thank you. I would ask whether you intend to exercise your right of challenge? No, sir. The officers assigned to sit on this court are satisfactory and acceptable. Very well. Captain, will you please state for the record whether Commander Booker is suspect of any violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice? Commander Booker is not suspect of any violation at this time. Very well. I'm grateful for this opportunity to detail my service as commander of the USS Pueblo. I want to say that I am proud to serve in the Navy of the United States of America and proud of my shipmates on the Pueblo, each and every one of them. Speaking for the full ship's complement now, all of the men under my command, may I say that I, we never lost faith in our government or our God, or in our eventual return home. I can't say enough about the men. I intend to cite them, many of them, for heroism. This subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee is instructed to ascertain the national security implications implicit in the loss of the USS Pueblo, the requirement for corrective action, both administrative and legislative, and the requirement for possible changes in the code of conduct for military personnel captured by the enemy. We are deeply concerned with the chain of command and control. We are after facts. When, sir, did you receive orders appointing you as commanding officer of the Pueblo? In December 1966, Pueblo was originally an Army FS cargo ship built in 1944, deactivated, and later used as a South Korean merchant marine vessel. What was her status in 66? She was in mothballs in 1966 when they towed her to Bremerton to outfit her as an AGER, Auxiliary General Environmental Research Ship, also known as an ELINT, Electronic Intelligence Vessel. That conversion was underway when I first saw the Pueblo at the Puget Sound shipyard. Captain? My previous assignment had been as assistant to the operations office of Submarine Flotilla 7. Captain Booker, sir. I nevertheless felt grateful and fortunate in having received my first command. She needs watertight hatches, a new communication system, damage control plating, collision alarm. Commander, we're spending an awful lot of money on a small and old ship. consists of 10 rifles, 6 pistols, and 50 hand grenades. There's better than $2 million worth of secret electronic equipment stored in the research spaces and in the cryptographic center under my command. Theoretically, my men can listen in on anything in the air or under the water. We can record radio and radar emissions from far inland and send them back to the United States security agencies. However, only four of my 30 men have ever been to sea before, and only one knows how to operate and repair all of the equipment. We've got no damage control system and only one public address system. 
We've got two amplifiers with tuning problems and a general alarm with bugs. And no collision alarms. Damn it, sir. I've only got fire axes and sledgehammers to destroy the secret electronic equipment and codes. I've got grenades, but we couldn't use them. <laughs> I haven't even got enough weighted bags to sink everything in. Hell, it would take us nine, ten hours just to destroy our classified publications. Captain. Captain, the Loran Long Distance Navigational System has a one to one and a half degree east gyro error which could throw our position plots off <laughs> by about five months. There had been a cutback of one million dollars in the appropriations for outfitting the Pueblo. I'm not sure who made that decision in Washington, but in many cases, the improvements we requested were deferred. In addition, the Navy kept extending us in Puget Sound for four weeks at a time. Therefore, any work that would have taken five weeks was not recommended. Did you attempt to improve your ship's capabilities? I did. I was especially concerned about the secret compartments. I wrote the Chief of Naval Operations, giving my reasons why I thought a modern destruct system was so essential. The Admiral replied that the equipment had to be built integral to the existing system and that it wasn't possible because of expense and time to rebuild. Do you have a copy of that communication? No, sir. The letter was either destroyed when we were captured or it was captured with us. However, I requested and received authorization to increase the level of personnel to the, to the limit that I thought essential. I eventually received parts with which we improved the interior communication system. I managed to have a hand-operated incinerator installed. We did not have the time nor authorization to do everything I recommended, but we improved Pueblo to the limit the Navy thought necessary. Ship's company about hey. At the moment of breaking her commissioning pennant, the USS Pueblo becomes the responsibility of her commanding officer, Commander Lloyd Mark Booker, United States Navy, who together with his ship's company has the duty of making and keeping his ship ready for any service demanded by our country, in peace or in war. Captain? Thank you, sir. She was my first command. She was a small ship. But only someone who has been given command of a ship can understand the intense pride that an individual has in that, in that ship. It becomes a part of you. It becomes a part of every sinew and every muscle and every thought of your life for the entire time that you have command. 31 or 32 states were represented out of the 82 people who survived, and they were young children. Kids, really. But they were men in every sense of the word, and I am intensely proud of them. I'd give a lot to serve under Commander Booker again. He's the best officer I've ever served under. I only made it because of my faith in God and my country and the decisions of my commanding officers. I'm just proud of what the captain went through with us there and what he did to bring us home. Admiral Johnson. Did you issue the operational and shipping orders for Pueblo? Yes, in December at Yakuska. Would you read that order into the record, please? Certainly. Sir. The mission of the Pueblo will be naval surveillance and intelligence collection in support of high priority national intelligence objectives. The Pueblo's closest point of approach to the Korean Communist Soviet landmass offshore islands will be 13 nautical miles. Armament shall be stowed or covered in such a manner as not to elicit interest from surveyed unit or units. Armament shall be employed only in case threat to survival is obvious. There was an unclassified cover story, was there not, sir? Yes. Pueblo, an unarmed U.S. naval auxiliary, is to conduct technical research operations in an ocean environment to support oceanographic, electromagnetic, and related research programs. 
I'll be glad to discuss classified intelligence objectives of the, of the mission in the closed session. Admiral Johnson, did you personally inspect Pueblo? Yes, on January 3rd and 4th. I was favorably impressed with the ship and with Commander Boca. I discussed minor discrepancies in the general problem of stowage of gear with him. I observed the newly installed 50 caliber machine gun stands and the incinerator. I visited all parts of the ship, including the research spaces. I pointed out the need to conduct training and to hold drills and damage control and emergency destruction. On my departure, I wished Commander Buka good luck, and I asked him if he had any further problems in which he needed assistance. The reply was in the negative. Commander Booker had been denied certain improvements he requested. We'd had 14 previous missions, all successful, similar in nature, by the USS Banner, the Pueblo sister ship, which carried nearly identical equipment. I arranged for Commander Clark, the skipper of the Banner, to get together with Commander Booker and give him as much help, information, and guidance as possible. Hello, oh, no Joe, Pete. Uh, once off the Soviet coast, I was harassed by several Soviet PT boats. One signaled, heave to or I'll fire on you. I've had guns trained on me by communist Chinese ships from as close as 20 yards. Is that so? I obeyed my orders. I never went to general quarters. I never issued firearms. I never engaged in provocative action. No, they never touched me. My advice to you, Pete, is what worked for the banner should work for the Pueblo. I like San Diego. The hotel is very comfortable. There are the palm trees and the bay, and there's plenty of sun, and there's the swimming pool. And the boys have their own rooms. There's maid service and a portable TV. It's temporary, but it's a good place to wait. And it's only for six months. Only until spring or early summer. That's all. Only someone who has been given command of a ship can understand the intense pride that an individual has in that, in that ship. We prepared to sail on our mission. Lieutenant Schumacher, did you conduct training exercises with the 50 caliber machine guns? Yes, sir. We improved our capabilities, but the guns weren't shielded. They were army guns. Furthermore, it took us over an hour to knock the ice off the toplings before we could get into action. By January 14, we were in North Korean waters near Wonsan. I ordered the men to de-ice the ship. If she got too top-heavy, she could capsize. We knocked the ice off with wooden mallets and steam hoses. We reached our northern boundary just below the Soviet port of Vladivostok. We spotted land. Later, we sighted two merchant ships off Hung An, but they didn't seem to spot us. By evening, we were in the vicinity of Myungdo, North Korea. I had to climb up the damn mast to repair a piece of equipment from the intelligence compartment. We maintained radio silence. By the time the equipment was repaired, we were 12.8 miles from the coast. That's as close as we ever came. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea calls upon the United States aggressors to eliminate its hostile acts along the east coast of our nation. We make it clear that the forces of the People's Republic will retaliate against any continued encroachment on our territorial waters. United States aggressors, listen to us. We are prepared. I was never told. I was never advised of the North Korean warnings. Admiral Moura, who was it that placed the Pueblo off the shores of North Korea when anyone who could read a newspaper knew of threats and constant attacks by North Korea on South Korea? Can you tell us who made that final decision that, in effect, this was a safe mission? The procedure for establishing a mission of this kind is quite lengthy, in the sense that it goes up the chain of command, through the Pacific Fleet Commander, through the Commander-in-Chief Pacific, and through the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and to the Secretary of Defense. I understand the chain of command, Admiral. But if you know, would you state who it was? Well, sir, I think that the final decision First, let me say that this ship was operating on the high seas. Did you make the decision on the Pueblo? 
Did I? Yes. No, Congressman, I did not. Do you know who did? Because if you don't know, it's... One man made that decision. I've been around as long as you have, Admiral, and somebody made that decision. And I think it proper, if possible, that this committee know who made it. Possibly you do not know. What I'm trying to make clear is, Mr. Congressman, that no one single individual made the decision. The ship was under the unified commander, under the fleet commander-in-chief, and under the operational commander for operational purposes. It was approved here in Washington. Who approved it here in Washington? It was approved by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and in addition, referred to the Secretary of Defense. Ah, so at least the decision was approved by the Secretary of Defense at that time, is that correct? By his office, yes, sir. Whether he directly participated, I have no way of knowing. I believe, Admiral, that you cannot delegate responsibility. I believe both of us know that. Yes, sir. In that sense, the mission was approved by the Secretary of Defense. It was very cold, below zero. The men would rest informally, and so was I, in accordance with our orders. On January 21, we spotted an SO-1 North Korean subchaser. It passed within a thousand yards, but it didn't seem to show any interest. I was flying the international signal for conducting hydrographic operations, but not the national ensign. We departed the Myingdo area for the area of Wonsan Harbor. On the afternoon of January 22, we were conducting surveillance 18 to 20 miles north of the nearest land. We were approached by two North Korean government fishing vessels, painted gray. No arms were visible, and they were piloted by civilians, standard Oriental fishermen. They circled us at 20 yards. One of them aimed his ship at my bow and avoided collision at the last moment. I considered that we'd have been detected and I was certain they would report us, so in accordance with my sailing orders, I prepared my first situation report and ordered it transmitted at five in the afternoon. It took 14 hours before I was able to establish contact with Japan. By then it was seven in the morning of January 23, the day of the incident. I transmitted my second situation report, it was routine. We were 15 to 16 miles from Ungdo Island, Dead in the water, conducting, doing our job. Uh, noon on the day of the incident. Yes. Captain, we got a ship. Closing fast. What was your position? Steady. She's... 15 to 17 nauticals from Ungdo. She's North Korean. I ordered an immediate radar check. She's closing fast, Skipper. SO-1 subchaser, Captain. She's at general quarters. I want Lazy on the bridge. Chief Lazy to the bridge. I will take the con. Captain has the con. Hoist the signal for a hydrographer. Hoist hydrographer emblem. SO-1 subchaser, Schumacher, get her specification. Yes, sir. Steve, return to your research spaces and stand by. Yes, sir. SO-1 spec skipper. Armament. One three-inch gun, two 37-millimeter engine aircraft, 40 small mines. Speed. 25 knots. She'll run around us. It's still closing. Good afternoon, sir. Remains to be seen, Chief. You're OD. Yes, sir. I want the crew below and out of sight. Modify general quarters? Not yet. Now, this is the captain speaking. All hands will lay to below deck. Repeat, all hands will lay to below deck. What the hell's going on? We got company. Very friendly. Yeah. Break out the message blanks for emergency situations and inform the shack I want the line kept open to Camastaya. Yes, sir. Research. Research, Harris. Steve. Tell the oceanographer to start dragging the man. Let's have a little research underway. Yes. Chart room. Yes, Skipper. I want you to keep a special log. A running account of everything from here on in. Yes, sir. He's at one 
thousand yards, sir. And she's hoisting flags. Signalman? They're asking, what is your nationality? They must know that. They're confused because of our dress. Do we reply, Captain? Hoist the national ensign. Aye, sir. Engine room. Chief Goldman. That's the captain. Aye, sir. Light off all engines and prepare to answer all bells. Yes, sir. More company, Skipper. Have the radio man prepare for a flash and tell Kamasai to keep the line open. Yes, sir. What do we got, Gene? I make them three PT-type boats closing fast. PT motor torpedo boats, P-4 class. Just a minute, Skipper. Uh, this is Chief Goldman. We're ready to answer all bells, Skipper. Very well, uh, uh, Chief. Uh, uh, more company here will keep you informed. Let's have it. Uh, one, possibly two, 12.7 millimeter guns, two torpedoes, Speed 50 knots. The duck guns are mounted, huh? Coming right across our bow. Playing forfeit. Nice game. Can you make it? Eve two, or I will fire. Run that again. Eve two, or I will fire. The bastards. Signal we are in international waters. We are in international waters. Situation report, sir. considered feasible, otherwise to withdraw slowly to the northeast. Got it? Yes, Skipper. I'm trying to find out what the officer in charge wants, but everyone topside worrying. Well advised. Transmit this at once. A change your tape and got a flash coming for you now. Hold it right there. Let me see that. Skipper wants to transmit it now. Damn thing is wrong, friend. You're out of your skull. Here. Son of a... You, keep your line open. It's not ready, so we'll have to keep up chatter. Please keep your line open. Things still confused topside. Any response, Fred? We haven't transmitted it yet. Why not, damn it to hell? Sir, you designated the message pinnacle flash. Referring it all the way to the White House. That is the pinnacle designation, sir, but you should have given it the precedence critic for top priority. I was told flash. No, sir, it should go critic. That's right, sir. Critic? Critic one, sir. Very well, then. Transmitted critic one, but immediately. Yes, sir. Return to your spaces, mister. Yes, sir. Worse out there now, got more company and not doing too good with them. Send it. Change your tape and got a critic one coming for you. Closing in. Testing our nerve. They're doing good. They may not know what we're carrying. They better not find out, Skipper. How long do you jack it would take us to scuttle? About two hours. Anyway, we're only at 30 fathoms. Not nearly enough, Gene. We could run to 100 fathoms and scuttle from there. How long do you judge the boys would last in this water? About five minutes at 35 degrees, they'd all drown. Research. Research, Harris here. Harris, this is the captain. Yes, sir. Prepare to destroy classified materials. Prepare to destroy? Yes, master. Yes, sir. The captain has given us the order to prepare to destroy. We've done that, Lieutenant, as far as we can, but most of the boys are below. Then stand by. We've got 600 pounds of classified documents. We better start doing something. We'll wait for further orders, Chief. More company, Skipper. Nice see her. Another torpedo boat. General quarters. We're not to take provocative action. We've got the whole damn North Korean Navy on us. Officially, they haven't got a Navy. All right, that's a company. Big aircraft coming into starboard. Easy boats, back in quarters. Fenders rigged. There's troops on them. They're preparing to board. They're making signals, sir. Damn nerve. They say, follow in my wake, I have a pilot aboard. I'll be damned if they're gonna get away with that. Engine room. Engine room. Chief Goldman speaking, sir. All engines ahead, one third, make turns for six knots. Six knots. Aye, aye, sir. Right full runner. Right full runner. On the course zero eight zero. On the course zero eight zero. We're getting the hell out of here. The runner is right full, sir. Make signal. Thank you for your consideration. I'm departing the area. Thank you for your consideration. I am departing the area. Schumacher. 
inform command of our situation. Detail the PT boat numbers and locations and our intention to depart the area. Yes, sir. Sound modified, General Quarters. Signal from the ship chaser. Heave to or I will fire on you. Full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. Commander Booker, do you mean to say you never even imagined that you might be attacked? No, sir. I had read nothing, nor had I received any briefings that would indicate there was any danger of coming under attack, providing we carried out our orders. You never considered what your actions might be in such an eventuality? No, sir, I did not. Sir, did you ever brief the Pueblo crew about the mission? The 30 men in Lieutenant Harris's detachment knew the purpose of the mission. No, yes. I refer to the other uh, 53 members of the crew. Were they informed what kind of a mission they were going on? No, sir. I did not give this information to them. I did not want to cause undue worry. They knew it was not illegal and that they were just carrying out their orders. No one even thought that it was hazardous duty? No, sir. The Navy rated our mission as minimal risk. Well, there was an acceptable minimal risk. Certain risks must be taken in almost every type of military operation, and there were risks taken in this type of operation, and you know it. I think everybody realizes it. We had to take a certain degree of risk to carry out the mission, as we do on many missions. It's the same way in civilian life. We do many things that are risky, such as getting into an automobile and driving around the block. This type ship, on a mission of this kind, they knew what it was there for. And you know they knew what it was there for. It was a spy ship. Full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. Full speed. They're after us. I want their subchaser on our stern. Another subchaser's coming into port, Captain. Signal from the subchaser. Heave to, or I will fire on you. And they're closing the gap. This was a United States Navy ship operating on the high seas, manned by United States sailors. No American ship has been seized on the high seas for 150 years. In other words, there was no deliberate attempt made to conceal the fact that this was a Navy ship on a Navy mission. No, Congressman, none at all. International law protects vessels in international waters. It's my understanding that the Court of Inquiry developed inf information that the Pueblo's ensign was not flying and was broken out, in fact, only after the North Korean ships appeared in sight. Is that correct? When ships are out at sea alone, they do not fly the ensign for the simple reason that they cost money and they immediately disintegrate in a high wind. 
Then it is now the Navy's position that the Pueblo's mission was an overt surveillance operation. It always has been, sir. Many nations conduct offshore surveillance. The Soviets have 40 such ships. Then who insisted or recommended this rather elaborate cover story about the hydrographic operation? The hydrographic mission was not a cover story. It says in the operations order, it is a cover story. Since the Pueblo incident, any cover we had has long since gone out We're the window. We're not talking about whether it's a cover today. We're talking about whether it was a cover at the time it took place. I won't quarrel with you as to whether you want to say it was a cover story. Because from a practical, real-life point of view, it's not an effective cover. Now, I agree with you, Admiral. It wasn't an effective cover at all. And I'm curious as to why the Navy went through the charade. What did you gain by making it a cover story? What do you gain by saying in your operations orders, this will be the cover story? Well, sir, it's in the nature of the intelligence game. The classified materials are all I care about now. Yes, sir. I want our position. Mr. Harris, sir. 15.6 miles off Hungdo, sir. Bastards. We're in international waters. Signal, you have denied my right of free passage. You have denied my right of free passage. Research is the captain. Harris here. What's your status? Publications are being gathered for burn, sir. Other material is being smashed. All equipment unnecessary for contact with Japan is being smashed also, sir. Very well. Sir. Lacey, take the con. I have the con, sir. Yes, sir. Go to my cabin. Clean it out. Burn my files and throw my sidearms overboard. Yes, sir. I don't want them to get anything important, you understand? Yes, sir. Are we surrendering, sir? Don't forget my pistols. Yes, sir. They're signaling. Follow me. I have a pilot aboard. a fish on the line. Follow me. I have a pilot aboard. All I had one third. All I had one third. for us to move faster. They can go to hell. We'll maintain the same speed. One third ahead, no faster, Gene. We need time to give the men time to destroy everything. That's my primary concern. Time. I would like to emphasize that contrary to articles that have been published in newspapers, that no decision was made to send aircraft to relieve the Pueblo. I, in fact, personally made the decision to send aircraft, issued appropriate orders to effect such action, and 5th Air Force fighters were launched out of Okinawa as rapidly as possible. Well, General McKee, were those orders anything but verbal? Verbal orders to the commander of the 18th Fighter Wing. Did those orders say, Go to South Korea and refuel, or go to the Pueblo at once on harbor? I said you are to launch aircraft as soon as possible. I said you will proceed to Osan, Korea, refuel as soon as possible, proceed to the scene at once on harbor, and strike at any forces opposing the Pueblo. Definite orders to go to Korea, refuel, and strike. Go to Korea, refuel, and strike. Then why didn't they strike in support of the Pueblo? Unfortunately, they could not get to the scene prior to darkness or prior to the time the Pueblo entered the three-mile limit. Therefore, when the aircraft landed at Osan, I directed that they not be relaunched. 
because it was dark. Because at that time it was dusk, approaching dusk. And nobody from the Department of Defense or the White House or anybody else caused you to make any change in your determination? No one. Suppose, in your judgment, and this is hindsight, that your planes had been on alert and had managed to reach the Pueblo in time to strike on her behalf. Do you think you could have changed the outcome of this tragic incident? Now, this is pure speculation, sir. I think one of three things would have happened. We would have changed it. I would have gotten my aircraft shot down. Or we would have started another war. I don't know which. Maybe all three, General. Intelligence detachment was not under my control. The commanding officer was responsible. I asked the admiral to place them under my direct command. The request was refused. Who made that decision? I was Commander Boga Goodluck. I asked him if there were any further problems in which he needed assistance. He replied in the negative. Was the captain permitted to inspect the research spaces? Certainly, the captain could enter at any time. I had to knock on the door to gain admittance. The triple combination lock has changed frequently. I couldn't continually memorize new combinations. On occasion, the captain permitted unauthorized personnel to enter the research compartment. In my capacity as commander of the ship, I had to use my powers of persuasion and personality to solicit their help. Nevertheless, I didn't know how much paper we carried. Any space was open to the captain. But not the file cabinets. Which were under the direct control of the national security. More time, captain! We need more time, captain! Did we have the facilities and the procedures for the rapid destruction of classified material aboard the Pueblo? The answer is yes under certain situations and no under others, such as unlawful seizure. Now, that's not something I just thought of. We need more time! I decided to stop the ship to give Harris and his detachment more time to destroy the classified materials and to give me an opportunity to thoroughly inspect the ship. All stop. All stop. Now, use that time, Harris. Get that stuff overboard now, right now. Tim, destroy that log I asked you to keep. Yes, sir. Skipper, sub chasers coming up out there waving that we should get moving. They can screw up. So one closing to 2,000 yards. What the hell do we have from command? Nothing, Captain. Send this. It's critic. How about some help? These guys mean business. Where is this man? Huh? 
Rogers, isn't it? Yes, sir. Right, this man is dying. Take care of this man. I'm doing the best I can, sir. Yes, please. You last and hope someone does something. We're helpless at this time and cannot do anything but Any wait. Word from command. Nothing, sir. Keep transmitting. I am, sir. Have one code list and only one remaining, destroying all codes and classified materials. And just ring up PT phone. They've assembled a boarding party. They're signaling us to stop. They want to come aboard. instructed Commander Booker to use his machine guns as a matter of survival. Does survival mean survival of the ship or survival of the crew? It means survival of one or both. The Navy has no precedent on whether the ship or the crew should be saved? The Navy wants both saved. That's motherhood and apple pie. The question is, wasn't Commander Booker obeying his orders if, in his judgment, he could only save his crew by not firing his guns? That, sir, would be the decision of the captain, the man in command on the spot. It was his responsibility. We're surrendering? flew the National Ensign into Wonsan Harbor. Did you ever think to take your guns and point them over the side of the ship and blast them as they came up? Damn it, that's what I would have done before I surrendered. Any effort to fight them further would have been senseless. To have manned the machine guns or to have tried to run further would have meant certain death. The guns were frozen. I was outgunned 50 to 1. I'd obeyed my orders. I couldn't go to war with all of them. Admiral Mora, did the Joint Chiefs of Staff participate in the decision not to try to rescue the Pueblo? 
The decision was made by General McKee and his acting supervisor in Honolulu, and by several commanders discussing this over the telephone. But did it get back to Washington? Yes, the entire loop was closed. I'm trying to find out whether the local commanders made the decision on their own or whether they waited until orders got back from Washington. I don't think anybody overruled a recommended course of action. Then the decision not to send forces to rescue the Pueblo was made, was it not, very much on the same grounds on which Commander Booker decided that it didn't make much sense to take on all those PT boats. Namely, that the circumstances had him outgunned, outpositioned, and outmaneuvered. I don't think I'd express an opinion on that, sir. It's my understanding from newspaper accounts that the president was not advised of this until after the ship was at Wonsan, or very close to Wonsan. And then he is reported to have said that he was very glad that they didn't start dropping bombs over there. Is that substantially correct to your knowledge? I'm sure I know nothing about that, Mr. Congressman. Admiral, were there plans to assist the Pueblo? Yes, there were forces on call. What forces? I could not try to provide what aircraft belonging to the 5th Air Force were available. In my opinion, Admiral, that is not an adequate answer. You took the responsibility. You determined this was a mission defended by on-call forces. Now, it's a fair question to ask you, what were those on-call forces? Well, I'll now try to provide for the record. I just to believe there weren't any. I'd like for you to prove me wrong. The Enterprise was 600 miles from Wonsan at the time. But her jets were lashed to her flight deck by a status of forces agreement with Japan, weren't we they? We had to find her aircraft in Okinawa. It would have taken two and one half hours to scramble those planes. They could have never reached the Pueblo in time. In my definition, they were on call. I could also mention possible support from our aircraft in South Korea. Armed with nuclear warheads? Your testimony about planes and other help being on call is misleading. Because it actually proves there was nothing on call. When we added up, we had a contingency plan to use forces which did not exist. Yes. Commander Booker. Was the decision to surrender the Pueblo entirely your own, sir? Yes, entirely my own. Was she seaworthy? Commander, was she seaworthy? There was no damage below the waterline. I refer to Navy Regulations Article 0730. The commanding officer shall not permit his command to be searched by any person representing a foreign state nor permit any of the personnel under his command to be removed from the command by such persons as long as he has the power to resist. I did not have the power to resist. At this juncture, it is my duty to inform you that facts revealed to this court to date render you suspect of a violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The court advises you of your right to remain silent and cautions you that you need not make any statement which might incriminate you in regard to that offense. I did not commit any offense. I will continue to give my testimony. I see this as an opportunity to clear any question, any slur which might exist. I am not surprised. I understand that a judicial warning is a totally correct and routine procedure. But I will say that I think there are inconsistencies in the code of conduct which was written for men at war, ground soldiers, under entirely different circumstances. I will say that the Navy left us there, left us at sea, and left us in captivity for nearly a year. I will say that I think we did as well as anyone under the circumstances and better than most. And I will, at the appropriate time, enter into the record the names of those many members of the crew who I wish to recommend for citations and medals, men of whom I am very proud. Yes. 
Commander, you testified that as the Koreans boarded the Pueblo, you passed the word that the men should give only name, rank, and serial number if questioned. That is correct. Had the crew been instructed in the code of conduct? I feel the code is a doctrine all hands should know. Therefore, you knew the provisions of the code. Yes, I was acquainted with the code. Did the Korean boarding party interrogate you? <laughs> they asked me questions which I refused to answer. What questions? They asked, uh, what is your mission? Why are you spying? They asked about the ashes and fires on the deck. I said that was where we made ice cream. They knocked me to the deck. I kept demanding medical aid for the wounded men, but they ignored me. They kept repeating the same questions. Which of you belong to the CIA? What is your mission? Why are you spying? I said we were engaged in electronic research and sun study and oceanographic research. At once on harbor, they blindfolded us and led us off the ship. Photographers followed us everywhere. I could hear people, and when my blindfold slipped, I could see them, hundreds of North Korean men, women, and children shouting and shaking their fists at us. Korean troops restrained them. They forced us into, into a train. For five hours, they roughed me up and interrogated me. I protest this treatment. They shoved us into buses. You have arrived at your destination. <coughs> Where's the captain? California? There is no such place. You spy for CIA. Can you please help somebody? This man is losing a lot of blood. You will be sad. Now, what do you say? Can you please tell us, sir, where we are? Attention! 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 I am the commanding officer. These are the rules of life for the Pueblo war criminals. You will stand at attention. You will not move. You will not talk. You will listen. You will obey. And you will confess. Sir, I protest this treatment of my crew. Let go! Oh, my what? men are badly ah! wounded. I protest! Let go! Dismiss. They threw 10 men into one room, eight in each of two others two and another, and the rest in groups of four. The officers had separate rooms. I was alone. I had not slept in over 30 hours. Hello, Captain. Please, what can you tell me? I just can't believe it. No, I haven't heard anything officially. I mean, just the television and the radio. What will they do to Pete? What can I say to the boys? What is your name? Lloyd Mark Booker. What is your home address? Sir, I am only obligated to give you my name, rank, and serial number. Bahia Motor Hotel, San Diego, California. Now, when did you take command of the Pueblo? I will not answer that question. May 1967. I have it all here. Now, what is the point of denying it? The provisions of the Geneva Conference. <laughs> What is the official designation of your ship? It is an AKL-44. Sir, I protest this treatment. And the treatment of my crew, some of my men are... You have no right wounded. to protest. You and your men are spies. Agents of the Central Intelligence Agency. My ship was in international waters engaged in 
Electromagnetic and oceanographic <laughs> research. Uh, here in your own service record, it states from January 1954 to June 1954, you attended a CIC school. CIC stands for Combat Information Center. Central Intelligence. Your mission was to spy in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. You intruded deeply into our territorial waters to accomplish that purpose. No, sir, we did not. Your ship was loaded with electronic equipment for surveillance work. We have your ship, your machines, your sailing orders, and you. You are spies and will be punished as spies are always punished. My men Your are... one possibility is to confess. My men are entitled to protection, sir, under the provisions of the Geneva Convention. Treat it as civilian espionage agents tried under Korean law and shot. Walk was in bad shape. He had open wounds from the shrapnel. His blood was clotted. And... He was stuck to a plastic sheet. Uh, they wouldn't get a doctor. I did what I could. I slept until quite late. A Korean woman brought me some bread and water and a bowl of turnips. I drank the filthy water and, and I waited. I thought we would be released in a couple of weeks or so. I never thought the United States would ever let this happen to us. I was not frightened. I was shocked when I saw the captain. Names and assignments, beginning with you. Booker, I am the captain. You. Lieutenant Schumacher, gunnery and operations. You. Lieutenant S. Harris, communications. You. Hudson Harris, supply officer. I ask each of you, did your ship violate the territorial waters of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. You are all liars. Do you see these? Do you recognize them? You think we are fools? Your ship was within eight miles of our land. No, sir. No? no? What was your location then, Captain? Sir, we are only obligated to give you our name, rank, and... I material. want confessions! Full confessions from each of you! There is a question of our rights... Your government is contriving officers. to start another war with us. That is not true, sir. No? Then why do you send ships to spy on us? Airplanes to violate our airspace, agents and provocateurs to infiltrate our population? I demand your confession. I demand... Decent treatment. If my government wasn't humane, you'd be dead already. Full confessions. Sincere, do you understand? We were conducting oceanographic research on the high... Spies center. should be shot. Spies should be shot. Now, what was your mission here? Why are there American troops in South Korea? To my understanding, the South Korean government asked us to be there. What did you say, Captain? The South Korean government... There is no South Korean government. There is only you, American imperialism. In 1950, we of the North worked to reunify our country. While in the South, your fascist puppet, Re murdered thousands of our patriots and jailed tens of thousands with American arms and American money. There was an election, and Rhee's party lost. And so, to preserve his illegal government, he invaded us, and you fought by his side. You bombed us, invaded us, killed our children, raped our women. Where was the Geneva Convention then? All my men lost a brother or parent to your American bombs and American guns. I tell you, the only safe place for you is here in this prison, because you Americans made yourselves so hated. You continue your constant aggression. Even today, there are 50,000 American troops in South Korea. Why? Why? Do we have troops in America? Your ship exposes again the true color of American imperialism, because it is a specialized armed spy ship. You cannot deny it. You are spies sent by your government. We have your secret papers. You are entitled to nothing. 
You are not even worthy to be considered under the laws of civilized nations. How do you wish to be shot? Individually or all together? Sir, <clears throat> release my crew and ship and just shoot me. You are an idiot, Captain. An idiot. We will shoot you all in the morning. He gave me some food, but I couldn't eat. I couldn't. I was returned to the interrogation room. The colonel was there. We called him Super C. He continued to rant and rave against the United States. They kept wanting me to say that we were CIA agents. They had CIA on the brain. I denied everything. After about 15 minutes, the colonel presented me with a typewritten confession and demanded that I sign it. I refused. And uh, they took me back to my room. The guards must have had orders. They beat me. Commander, would you like a recess? No. Are you able to continue? I would like to get this over with. It took me out again, this time to a larger room where I observed a long table piled with various and sundry pieces of paper, <clears throat> some of them stamped with classified stamps. I recognized very little of what was on the table, but some of the materials which I did recognize were highly classified. I hadn't even known they were on the ship. I also recognized uh, 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 copies of the banner reports I'd received in Pearl Harbor. I was shocked and overwhelmed to see these documents on the table. They asked me about some of the documents, and since they had the ship's name stamped all over them, I couldn't deny they came from my ship. And then uh, uh, they presented me with the same typewritten confession again. Again, I refused to sign it, and uh, they and I denied that we were trying to start a war with North Korea. Took me back to my room again, but I couldn't sleep. Well, speak up, sir. Please speak up. I order you to sign your confession. No. The document is the truth. No. Johnny. Your only hope for yourself and your crew is to confess your crimes. You are here! You will be given two minutes, two minutes to sign this document, or you will be shot. Can you hear me, Captain? President of the United States, Executive Order 10631, the Code of Conduct for Members of the Armed Forces of the United States. These are the rules of life for the Pueblo war criminals. I am an American fighting man. I serve in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. You will obey our orders unconditionally. I will never surrender of my own free will. If in command, I will never surrender my men while they still have the power to resist. You will stand at attention when a Korean enters the room. If I am captured, I will continue to resist by all means available. I will make every effort to escape and to aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. You will clean your rooms every morning.
become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information, nor take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. You will not attempt to communicate with other rooms or other prisoners. When questioned, I am bound to give only name, rank, service number, and date of birth. I will evade answering further questions to the utmost of my ability. I will make no oral or written statements disloyal to my country and its allies or harmful to their cause. You will lie on your bed at the required times. I will never forget that I am an American fighting man, responsible for my actions and dedicated to the principles which made my country free. You will sit in your chair unless specifically asked to do otherwise. I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. You will knock on the door for permission to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Continue. I've consulted with the court's medical advisor, as has Commander Booker. And the commander insists on continuing. Very well. There was a man strapped to a wall. They explained that he was a South Korean spy. The man was being tortured. He had a compound fracture in his right arm, with his bones sticking out. He was bare from the waist down. He'd completely bitten through his lower lip. His right eye was put out and his head was hanging down and there was a lot of black matter running out of his eye and coming down his cheek. I was completely overwhelmed. I blacked out and when I came to, they said this is what we do to spies this is what we will do to you. They said you will sign this confession or we will begin to shoot your people one at a time in your presence. I was not prepared to see my crew shot. I was convinced they were animals. I was convinced that they would do it. I knew that they would kill my people. And so I told them, I'll sign, sign. For the love of God, I'll sign the God damn confession. <laughs> Captain of the USS Pueblo, belonging to the Pacific Fleet, US Navy, who was captured after carrying out espionage activities after intruding deep into the territorial waters of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It was a rather monotone voice, and I felt it wasn't the captain's way of saying things, repeating trite phrases. But I knew the information had been gotten. They beat me and kicked me for hours, threatened to kill me. I made peace with my maker. I was prepared to die. There were emotional pressures, fear, 
fear of the unknown. I knew I had to keep my mind active. I didn't want them to destroy my mind. They stripped me and they beat me while I crawled around. I knew they had the records of the ship. They had everything they wanted to know. They said the men who worked for me would be shot. I couldn't see that happen. I felt they meant business. The code of conduct kept going round and round in my head. We were not involved in a war with these people. We were not prisoners of war. It was therefore difficult to know if the code of conduct applied. They made me hold a chair over my head for hours. Every time it slipped, the guard would kick me. They kept telling me classified facts. I thought all the records had been destroyed. They kept punching me in the face, punching and kicking me all over my body. After I told them I wasn't a spy, they beat me all over again. I couldn't do much for the wounded men. I tried to treat them, but I only had Boy Scout training. The room stunk of decaying flesh. The beatings didn't hurt as much as the fact that when we were pleading for help, we got no assistance at all from the largest Navy in the world. This hurt me more than anything. They wouldn't take my confession because I printed my name instead of signing it. They tortured me until I lost consciousness. When I awoke, they, uh, They, um, uh, that's all. <clears throat> I, had, I had had it. After I confessed, I tried to drown myself in a bucket of water in my room. I couldn't do it. My government demands an apology from the United States. Instead, the Americans threaten retaliatory action against us. They rush the aircraft carrier Enterprise into our coastal waters, bring U.S. aircraft to South Korea from Japan, call up thousands of U.S. reserves. Why? For what purpose? The attack on the USS Pueblo as it sailed in international waters was an act of piracy. Now that is why we have brought this matter to an urgent meeting of the Security Council. The government of the United States has no intention of apologizing for a violation of international law which we have not committed. We do not know what is behind this North Korean provocation, but we shall do what is necessary. Do not miscalculate by trying to resolve this case by resorting to force of arms. U.S. imperialists, our people and our people's army will return retaliation for retaliation. All-out war for all-out war. Can you describe your mental attitude at this phase of your activity? Yes, sir. I had an extreme... Hatred for the Koreans. The one thing that I wanted more than anything else was... Just take your time. I'm sorry. Well, let me rephrase the question. Um, after the initial phase, as time went on, did you begin to get stronger? Yes, sir. Well, let me withdraw the question. No, I want to go back to the question. What I wanted was to take my life. I, I couldn't do it. I was hoping I would hear some bombers. I wanted to see a nuclear flash. Did the Koreans make any gestures of kindness? Yes, sir. They, they gave me a plant, a, a potted green plant. And what did you do with it? I killed it. I killed it by urinating on it. I hated it. I had an extreme hatred of everything there. I watched it die. General, you served as a negotiator for the release of the Pueblo crew. Yes, I was with the United Nations Command Component of the Military Armistice Commission at Panmunjom. Well, how do you judge the character of the Koreans from your dealings with them? Well, both North and South Koreans have struggled for many generations to survive in a cruel climate with many foreign invasions. Now, these circumstances have made these people a hardy but cruel race. And the farther north one goes, the more cruel they are. Kim Il's son runs a type of communist police state. He whips up the North Korean people's hatred, primarily against the United States. Sends missions into South Korea for sabotage, murder, and even the attempted assassination of the president of South Korea. The North Korean people just don't have any feelings. They are completely without scruples or conscience. 
They uh, don't follow the Geneva Convention in dealing with prisoners of war. What do you say to a Mongolian savage who holds 82 of your countrymen as hostages? I evaluated the North Koreans. I decided they were unsophisticated technically. Their society is primitive. They didn't understand much of what they had uh, captured. They were harassing and beating us in order to obtain cooperation, what they called uh, sincerity. In other words, for propaganda purposes. If they thought we cooperated, they would be satisfied. But if they thought we weren't playing their game, we would be beaten. One and two. And there was a wall 12 to 15 feet high. Korean guards with machine guns patrolled on top of it. There was an athletic field out there with a track around it. I didn't see any dogs, just cards and machine guns. We gave the guards names to fit their personalities. Specs, silver lips, <laughs> uh, rabbit, possum, oh. Colonel uh, Speck, uh -huh. Major Flatface, uh -huh. and Captain Queer. <laughs> <laughs> and every month we gave a guard the uh, a bleep of the month award. <laughs> <laughs> in the morning, we had uh, two pieces of bread, a bowl mm. of uh, turnip soup or no. potato soup, yeah. <laughs> which we called cream of petroleum soup. Yeah. <laughs> in the afternoon, we had bread, rice, some um, fried turnips, half-boiled grass, and occasionally a piece of fish, <laughs> which we called sewer trout. <laughs> in the evening, we had bread and rice. Well, we had eight and a half eggs in the 11 months we were there. Yeah. Never had any milk. Two. Yeah, we were hungry. One and two. The damn Koreans, they beat us for something, and they beat us for nothing. Every time we tried to go to the head, they beat us. In March, conditions improved somewhat. The men were given more privileges, the calisthenics, and uh, some recreational facilities. I determined that our resistance would be designed to fool and mock the Koreans in our phony confessions and letters and photographs home. We'd slip messages out of Korea through the nuances in what we said. We'd let our people know that we were alive. And everything they made us say was just a bunch of damn lies. I scrubbed the captain's floor every morning, and he'd tell me to try to put things in letters, photographs, recordings, that the people back home would understand, but the Koreans wouldn't. I took the word back to the crew and passed it on. We'd all be marching to the mess hall, and a guard would yell for us to go faster, so the captain would yell, about face, and we'd all march double time back upstairs like they didn't know what they wanted. Really. I'd write a letter home and say, uh, loving kisses from your loving son, and then sign my full name and rank. Yeah. In my letter home, I sent regards to all my dead relatives. <laughs> they made a recording of my confession, and I spoke fast, so I sounded just like Donald Duck. In order to succeed in these efforts, uh, I had to establish a uh, situation of mutual respect for their commanding officer. I endured conversations lasting 12 and 13 hours with the colonel. During these marathons, he would carry on diatribes against the United States and uh, attempt to create doubt concerning the foundations of U.S. principles. I responded to the best of my ability. I should say that it was my distinct impression that I was winning these psychological battles. When we got home, the first thing we were told, practically the first, was that our messages, the truth, came through loud and clear. Attention! Attention, I said! Attention! Who pissed in the water bill? I want to know who's responsible. Who, I said, who? I did. Yeah! You're like an animal. Every time I try to go... No! We're sick and tired of being beaten every time we have to go to the head. That was cruel. Animal-like, provocative, purposely agitated, an insult. Plan! Device to force us to lose space. Will not happen again. You will clean the bathroom and continue to clean it. If I were you, I would kill him. He's disgraced you all. What is that? What? That. That? That? Oh, that. Gesture. What does it mean? 
Uh, it's a uh, good luck sign. I've never seen it before. Oh, well, it, it's a Hawaiian good luck sign. Is that so good? Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Right. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Right. 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 It's Hawaiian. Good luck. Came to my room to take my photograph for propaganda purposes and just as they snap the picture. Every day after calisthenics, I'd stand up in front of the guys and I'd... They asked a group of us to pose after a press conference. Give it to them. Stick it to them. Shove it to them. Now. We call it the Gypsy Tea Room. Uh, they brought the men in one at a time. There's usually a bottle of liquor, or some ginseng liquor, and some cookies. They had fancy cigarettes. It was uh, an attempt to befriend us, but also a naive attempt to open up intelligence channels to the US. They kept asking me questions about what I was going to do if I got released, and did I think our government would ever help us get released. I guess they figured we'd get out soon. They were trying to be friendly. Of course, we knew at the time it was better to say yes to everything than to argue, because it wasn't going to do any good anyway. Did they discuss the Negro situation in the United States? They talked about the riots and stuff back home. And they said when I get back, I should take part in the Negro upsurge. Was there any reference to your joining any Negro groups? Some. What Negro groups? Uh, nothing specific. Were you questioned about life in the United States? Yes, sir. Often. Were they curious uh, about your life, you think, because of your race? Yes, sir. And what did you tell them? I told them the way it is. Sir. You told them the truth? Yes, sir. killed in action in Vietnam, age 20. How do you feel about that, Angelo Strano? Your brother has been killed in an imperialist war. I wouldn't let them forget. I wrote a letter to the president soon after capture. I told him I prayed our government would do whatever was necessary to bring about the release of the crew. Well, the president answered that he was doing everything possible and that he had confidence that the Pueblo had done its duty. But when I asked for further information, a list of addresses so that I could write to all the other wives, they wouldn't give it to me. They said that they didn't want to encourage people who weren't in sympathy with the administration. So I organized by myself. I did everything I could. I continued to write and to speak out. I continued to urge our government to take action. I wouldn't let them forget. Get going! I told you. Tell me again. Oh, it's a good luck sign. What is it? A good luck sign. Lay out! Liars! 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 Dozens, hundreds of photographs all over the world. Damn it, bastards! Damn it! Pass the word. Each man of tortured may speak for himself, but he may not talk about his shipmate. Pass the word. You will confess what it means. You will confess your crimes all again, from the beginning, everything over again. Insincere bastards, you will confess, your government will confess, you will apologize, your government will apologize.
was an act of piracy. You bombed us, invaded us. Communist savages. Imperialist spies. Confess! It was a gesture of contempt. The Pueblo was not engaged in illegal activity. Now, the document I'm going to sign was prepared by the North Koreans and is at variance with the above statement. But my signature will not and cannot alter the facts. I sign this document to free the crew, and only to free the crew. of the United States of America, acknowledging the validity of the confessions of the crew of the USS Pueblo, shoulders full responsibility and solemnly apologizes for the grave acts of espionage committed by the US ship against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Simultaneously with the signing of this document, the undersigned acknowledges receipt of 82 former crew members of the Pueblo and one corpse. Commander Booker, what is your estimate of the success of the mission of the Pueblo until the time of seizure? On the day before we were captured, Lieutenant Harris informed me of certain low proficiency levels among the research personnel, which materially lessened our research collection abilities. Sir, was the voyage productive? No, sir. Both Lieutenant Harris and I agreed that the voyage had not been productive. Admiral Moore, on the same day that the Pueblo's mission was approved as a minimum risk mission, the National Security Agency suggested that it might in fact be considered hazardous. The director of NSA has stated that the warning was merely advisory in nature. But the warning was addressed to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We did not receive the message, Congress. It was received by your staff and redirected to Commander-in-Chief Pacific. I never received the message. An information copy was sent to the Chief of Naval Operations. Sir, the copy was never delivered. It is the unanimous view of this subcommittee that there exist serious deficiencies in the organizational and administrative military command structure of both the Department of the Navy and the Department of Defense. The inquiry reveals the existence of a vast and complex military structure, capable of acquiring almost infinite amounts of information, but without a demonstrated ability to relay that information to those charged with the responsibility for making decisions. I wish to present this list, final list, of the members of the crew who in various ways at various times demonstrated, discredited the North Korean communist efforts to utilize them for propaganda, efforts that might have resulted in reprisals or even death. This final list, the members of my crew, children really, kids. Carl F. Schumacher, Lawrence W. Mack, Ralph McClintock. Having concluded its investigation, this court will transmit its findings of fact and recommendations for administrative action to the convening authority. Timothy L. Harris, Wayne D. Anderson, Charles B. Law. Secretary of the Navy, I've received the following recommendations from the court of inquiry. Rear Admiral Frank L. Johnson, and Captain Everett B. Gladding shall each receive non-judicial punishment 
in the form of a letter of reprimand. We followed our orders. John C. Higgins, Jr., Robert J. Chicka, Monroe O. Lieutenant Goldman. Lieutenant Edward R. Murphy, Jr. should be given non-judicial punishment in the form of a letter of admonition. Robert J. Hammond, Jean H. Lacey, Stephen Lieutenant R. Stephen Harris. Lieutenant Stephen R. Harris should be brought to trial for three alleged offenses. Rogelio P. Abalone, Rizalino Alawage, Don E. Bailey. Lloyd Mark Booker should be court-martialed for five alleged offenses. What I did out there was the best possible military maneuver I could make at the time to accomplish all the things that had to be accomplished, namely, namely the saving of life. Herman P. Baldridge, Michael T. Barrett, Ronald no L. Barron. Concerning the guilt or innocence of these men, in my opinion, however, they have suffered enough. Howard E. Bland, Russell J. Blansett, Ralph D. Charges Bowden. against all of the officers will be dismissed. Every effort is being made to correct any Navy deficiencies which may have contributed to Pueblo seizure. The Navy leaders are determined that the lessons learned from this tragedy shall be translated into effective action. I believe in the United States of America with all of my might. It was an experience I'll have to think about for a long time in order to come to a sensible conclusion. I'll never be able to understand it. Rodney H. Duke, Victor D. S. Camilla, Policarpo P. Garcia, Francis J. Ginther, John W. Grant, Lee R. Hayes, Robert W. Hill, Earl M. Kistler, Norbert J. Klepak, James D. Layton, Harry Lewis, Roy J. Maggard, Larry J. Marshall, Michael A. O'Bannon, Dale E. Rigby, Raymond Rosales, Edward S. Russell, William W. Scarborough, James A. Shepard, Charles R. Sterling, Angelo S. Strano, Larry E. Strickland, Donnie Tuck, Harry Iredale. Carl F. Schumacher, Lawrence W. Mack, Wayne D. Anderson, Timothy L. Harris, Charles B. Law, John C. Higgins, Jr., Robert J. Chicka, Monroe O. Goldman, Robert W. Hammond, Gene H. Lacey, Stephen R. Harris,